Hi, this is Kim Hamer, pastor of Sling Baptist Church, community in Tull, outside of Benton, with your devotion taken from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 2, beginning with verse 24, going through chapter 3, verse 11. This is the recounting by Moses as he's preparing to go to Mount Pisgah to be taken into the promised land, and God is going to give him the opportunity. In fact, the Bible says that God told him to look to the north and to look to the east, and he would see the entirety of the promised land. And from uh, the advantage point where Moses was, he was pretty much dead center on the east side of the promised land. So he had a very panoramic view of what uh, the land looked like that God was going to give to the nation of Israel. And then God would take him into the eternal promised land. But as we pick up in chapter 2, verse 24, we find the nation of Israel is on the move and they are moving north on the east side of the river Jordan. And as they are moving north on the east side of the river Jordan, they begin to encounter occupants of the land that have one of two choices. They can either make peace with God and with his nation, or God will turn his nation loose on them, and they will uh, take the land by force if that's what they have to do. Now remember, as the nation of Israel was beginning to make this journey toward occupying their promised land, they had to live with the memory of 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and all the history that they had. Again, the value of history and keeping it, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, is that it can serve to motivate you and to guide you into the future and not to repeat the same mistakes that the past has shown. And so as they begin to make the advancement into the land, God tells them in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 25, he says, This very day I will begin to put terror and fear of you on the nations under heaven. They will hear the reports of you and will tremble and be in anguish because of you. And so God is going to go out before them and he is going to strike fear into the hearts of the individuals or the nations that are before them or staying between them and the promised land. But not everybody heeded the warning, as we'll find, because whenever you, that you begin to look at the first tribe or the first nation that they had to encounter, it was by a king named Sihon, who was the king of Heshbon. Now, he was approached by the nation of Israel and was asked to make peace that they could pass through his land and that anything that they did in the way of food or water or anything else that they would pay him uh, uh, an equal amount to the goods that they wanted or that they needed. And he refused. Now remember, they had also encountered Esau and the Moabites, and they had allowed the nation of Israel to pass through, and those are descendants of the tribe of, or of Abraham, and so they were actually extended family members, and they were peaceful with the nation of Israel. But when the nation of Israel came upon this king, he refused. And God, the Bible says, took advantage or capitalized on the stubbornness of his heart and also, the Bible says that his heart was obstinate or defiant. And so God was going to capitalize on this. And this was not the first time that God had used a heart like this. If you remember back with Pharaoh, whenever it was the nation of Israel was in bondage in Egypt, that God capitalized on the heart of Pharaoh. He gave him a chance to uh, find peace with God. He gave him a chance to do right as far as turning the nation of Israel loose to go and to worship him in the wilderness. But we know that Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and God capitalized on that. And God's going to do the same thing with this king. And we know how it didn't work out so good for Pharaoh. It's not going to work out so good for this king either. That would be a lesson to the world I'd want everybody to understand and know, is that God is a God of peace first. But if his peace is disrespected, if it is dishonored and is not taken advantage of, then God has to exercise all the other personalities, and he has to exercise the force that he has, there's no worldly kingdom that can stand up against the force of God. And so it's always better to take the peace that God extends than it is to reap the punishment of God's chastening hand. That is also true with eternity, that God extends to individuals while they live here on this earth an opportunity to make peace with him through accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But if they die in that lost condition, then God will issue punishment upon them for an eternity, and they will spend an eternity separated from God in a place called hell. And that pattern is true here on the face of the earth today. When God makes peace or offers peace with an individual, it's to that individual's or to that nation's best interest to accept the peace that God has to offer. But we find that Sihon brought his whole army out, and we find that as a result of it, there were no survivors that the nation of Israel, because they had been given the promise of God in chapter 2 and verse 25, were able to roll right over him. And they conquered not only his army, but there were no survivors left, only the plunder which amounted to the animals and to the material things and the cities that were occupied.
And so God allowed for one of the tribes, Reubenites, to be able to move right in and take possession of that uh, nation or that area that the king held almost ready-made. We find that the law, that uh, that as we go up the east side of the River Jordan, we find that the Reubenites get their tri or get their portion of the Promised Land on the east side of Jordan, then Gad, and then half the tribe of Manasseh. Now, God did give the Israelites a very specific instruction in chapter two and verse thirty-seven. He said, "Do not touch the Ammonites because they are descendants of Abraham." God did not want the nation of Israel in their occupation of the Promised Land to go to battle with the Ammonites because that was part of the tribe or of the descent, ascendage of the, is part of the lineage, excuse me, of Abraham. Now in chapter three, verses one through 11, they run into another king named Og, who was the king of Bashan. And we find that he had the same attitude as the previous king, and he's gonna meet with the same results as the previous king. We find that the Bible says that he committed his whole army to the effort to defeat the nation of Israel. But God again reminded the nation of Israel in chapter 3 and verse 2. He said, do not be afraid of them because I have handed them over to you and you will do to them what you have already done to others. And so we find that the motivation of the nation of Israel now taking courage that they have defeated one enemy and claimed one portion of the promised land is now going to carry them into the next battle with the king of Og. Who uh, did God help Israel strike down? Well, when he struck down the king of Og and his land, he struck down an area that had 60 cities in it, most of them fortified with high walls. And it also says that they had gates and they had bars of, uh, of iron. Now we find also that those high walls did not protect this king, nor did it protect the inhabitants. And there'd be a message to that. No matter who you are, whenever it is that you have not accepted the peace that God has to offer, there is no wall so, so tall, there is no iron so strong, and there is no city or refuge so fortified that God cannot reach you. It's best to accept the peace that God has to give you than to have him come in and find you. We find that all the inhabitants were struck down and that the whole geographical area was also taken, and now that's another portion of the promised land on the east side of Jordan that is being given to one of the tribes of the nation of Israel. But there is something I want you to know that I think is interesting. It just kind of emphasizes how powerful God is and how powerful God made the nation of Israel and how powerful God is and he wants to make his kingdom today here on earth equally as powerful. When you take a look at verse 11 in chapter 3, it, it seems like a verse that's out of context and you read it and you think, well, why is that even there in the first place? And it actually talks about the size of the bed of the king of Og. And it talks about it's six feet wide and it's like 13 feet long. And this could be reflective either of the king's ego and that he had a powerful kingdom and everything was at his disposal and he was on a power trip or ego trip, if you would. It could speak just to his physical size, that he was actually a big man and that he needed a big bed because he was a big man. But it also could give us some insight when you go back and you look at verse 5. It said specifically of those fortified cities that they had doors and they had bars of iron. Here in verse 11, you find that he had a bed of iron. One of the things I think that is notable and one of the things I think that would lend some insight as to how significant this battle was that the nation of Israel was in against this individual, this King Og, is that he had access to iron. He had access to build probably one of the best and most well-equipped armies that there was in the time because of what he had in the way of iron. But yet it was not significant enough to be able to stop God when he gave his people the promise that you will go in and you will occupy. You know, we're living in a battle time right now as Christians and we're living in a world where being a Christian is not popular. And we're living in a world where Christianity is continuing to come under attack more and more. But what we need to remember is that there's a time called the millennial reign here on earth where God is going to come and he is going to make peace among the nations that didn't want to have peace with God. And God is going to use his children in his kingdom here on earth in order to rule for a thousand years. No matter how powerful this world may seem today, it is going to fall to the hand of God and God will have his time of peace here on this earth.
So if you're listening today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, it would behoove you to accept Christ as your Savior and make peace with God. And if you refuse to make peace with God by making peace with His Son, who died to give you eternal peace on the cross at Calvary, just know this, God is coming. And when He comes, the opportunity to accept that peace will no longer be extended to you. But just like God did with the nations that stood in the way of Israel as receiving their promised land, as he rolled over them, he'll also roll over you. We find that they continue to make their sweep into the promised land, and eventually Moses is going to come back south, and he's going to stand at Mount Pisgah, and he's going to look over the promised land just before God calls him home to his eternal promised land. I pray that we would take God at his promise, hang on, fight hard, because God is coming.